My name is uh, Kadir Kasim. And uh, what actually brought me to Nebraska is, I could think of several reasons. Uh, first is family. Uh, I've had my uh, parents and my other two brothers who have been here for quite a few years. And I was uh, with my other brother in Houston. So at that time I said, it's time to kind of uh, get re reunification and just kind of stop being away from each other and just living together. So that's how actually the main reason I moved to Nebraska. And the second reason is, uh, while I was thinking of that, I found a, a, a great job. And I was at the, in line with, with that movement. I was actually um, talking to people that, you know, the people that I work with right now. And finally, I got approval, and they gave me an offer, and I started working with them. So two great reasons, I believe. What brought me to the United States is being a part of that special immigrant visa program and for being a cultural advisor and interpreter for the U.S. Armed Forces back in Iraq when, they, when the U.S. forces in, you know, came to Iraq and took the dictatorship down, I uh, felt like as a part of, of our ethics in finding a good job and working with them and helping them. So after a few years, things got really changed. And, um, they, you know, they started calling us betrayers and, you know, coming after us and killing us as, you know, interpreters and cultural advisors. So uh, main reason is actually just to find a safe haven and, you know, breathe the democracy and just come live in the United States. I lived in Houston for quite about a few years. So like end of February 2013, that's when I first got to the United States. And to the mid of April 2016. Back there. Because Houston is a huge city. Uh, you can consider it an international city. You have people from pretty much everywhere. And it's rich with oil, as you know, a lot of oil companies and gas. Uh, when I come, came here, I mean, I when working with YCC and, you know, dealing with other people here and there, I found actually it's more I just feel comfortable and more secure here in Nebraska, honestly. So before I moved here, um, I, I finished my, I went to school and I finished my uh, primary school and element, like elementary school, they called here, and uh, high school back in my hometown, Kanasur, it's in north of Singer Mountain. And then um, I moved to college and I started the college just right before, like two years or three years before the um, uh, U.S. come to Iraq and, you know, take the dictatorship down. At that time, I was like in third grade, and I, um, I started um, almost, uh, almost done uh, in 2003. I only have one year left. I was in third grade and, I mean, third year college, computer science. And then after all that, you know, I I, I decided that I need to find a job, and I started working uh, and serving the U.S. military as a cultural advisor and uh, interpreter. So primarily I was doing that job and, you know, just going back and forth. But and then for some reason I couldn't, because of the security, I couldn't finish my degree. So I had to actually kind of resign from that job and go back to school and get my degree in computer science. So I couldn't back, go back to the originally to the, to, the, to the university that I first got enrolled, which was Mosul University, because the security was not stabilized. And um, I found this other university in Kurdistan, which is called the University of Soleimaniya. So I went there and I finished my degree and I started uh, getting a career there actually as a teacher assistant until I uh, moved to the United States. So my job here, um, I just kind of stick with what I know and what I am aware of. So I stick with IT and computer. Um, so even now, I do uh, IT support, and I'm an IT specialist for, for this company that I work with right now, uh, Nebraska Municipal Power Pool. Still doing IT, uh, end user support, hardware support, uh, security, you name it, everything that, I mean, I can do, I would do it. Help desk, phone support, all those kind of stuff. Uh, so that will go back the, I, back in 2014 when ISIS, you know, uh, 
attack our villages back, in, back home in Iraq. And us as a group of young, and we already know each other from high school and back working with the military back in Iraq, we thought that we need to get together and do something for our community back home. And that's how actually I got involved with my friends. And uh, they started uh, Yazda, and then a few years later, I think a couple of years later, they started this uh, Yazidi Community Center. And uh, I thought it's like a part of my duties to be with my friends and help them with what our community here in Lincoln needs, just to kind of bridge some gaps and um, help them with whatever I can. Uh, sometimes if they need me translation or cover somebody or, I mean, whatever comes handy, I, I'll be more than happy to do it. And I know, like I said, uh, being a part of this community just to be integrated with, you know, the, the American community and be like an advocate for my community. Um, so that's actually one of the, one of the main reasons I actually joined YCC. So before I come to the United States, before I even, I had some friends here, they were always saying Nebraska, it's like, a, it's a ruler. Like we already know there is a big community lives here, but uh, whoever we talk to is like, man, why would you, why don't even think about going to Nebraska? It's all like ruler areas and it's like in the middle of nowhere. So it's like, okay, well, that was the first impression. That was the stereotype that it's very ruler. There's nothing in there. You can hardly find a shop or something. Then when I first came, I landed in Houston, and you know, we've had people here back and forth. And then when my family came here, that was I've never been to Nebraska before. Then when my rest of my family came here, like my parents and my other brother, they stayed with us for about three main, three months, and then we um, we thought that it's not a good place for them because they, especially like parents, they are elderly, and they told us that there is a lot of um, elderly people in my community that they can get along, they can go out of the house and just kind of get, you know, uh, acquainted with each, each other. So uh, my other brother was here, the older one. When he first came from Iraq, he just came straight to Nebraska. So we were kind of been talking back and forth. And, and then uh, after they moved, actually, I came here for a visit. And it was snow. I mean, we, we, we were not used to snow back in Iraq. So actually, I didn't say I did, that I didn't like it. I actually started to like it. And then... Every six, seven months, my brother and I, we would make a trip and come back and forth. So I started to like it and that, like, okay, I love, I love Four Seasons and it's less stressful traffic. So it's like, yeah, so actually I liked it. So the stereotype that I had before has changed completely. So now if people ask me, what do you think about Nebraska? I would think it's all the good stuff about Nebraska, I think. That's just my personal experience. It's a hard question, it's a tough question. Uh, the whole reason for this center to be open is to preserve the Yazidi culture. That doesn't mean that we will not be willing to integrate to the American community. But the whole reason for this center to be open is to actually be more open-minded and be integrated to the American community. Um, I think for the next few years or next decade, this thing will be changed. Uh, the people might be more open, and uh, there I, I believe there are some already people that who are already dating people from outside the community, which is, uh, I mean, no one can actually force anybody not to do something. I mean, if you are 18 years old and above, I mean, that's your, absolutely your own decision. Uh, but, you know, as a part of our culture, in order to be more, like I said, um, stick together and to preserve this culture, we would prefer, I personally prefer that people start dating from their own community and be open-minded and friend with everybody else. So, um, but I think, like I said, just uh, this could be changed and, and I'm, I'm pretty sure it's gonna change, but it's just something that we have to accept it. Because the whole, the whole reason for us is we, could, we, were, we were born and raised as Yazidis and Part of the Yazidi religion, just like any other religion, um, is that we were, we have our own privacy. That in order for us to be as Yazidi, we have to be born uh, from a Yazidi pants. And if if any one of those is not um, valid, when I say valid, is 
like you have your mother is Yazidi, but your dad is not, then you can't actually be per nowadays Yazidi rules. Um, so that's, that's the whole, like I said, that's the whole reason that we want to be still like all together, sticking together and preserve, preserve our culture and uh, reflect a good image about our society to the American uh, culture and be part of that community. So a part of that is the what YCC, I think, did a great job. Easy the Community Center here. They, at the beginning, they started some English classes and th some uh, basic religion class and you know native language Yazidi class to um, those kids uh, who would come and they would. We had teacher that they would teach them some, you know, tell them about the customs and traditions, especially for those kids who have not seen Iraq. I mean, their home, their parents' home, uh, I should say. Um, some of them who were like born here, born and raised here, they know nothing about that. They might still speak the language because her, her, his or her parents speak uh, like the, the language at home, so they can pick some here and there, but we are afraid that if there is not a real uh, well-planned or a roadmap, that a lot of this will be actually vanished. So we are doing our best through YCC and through the Yazidi uh, community, and there is another uh, Yazidi United Committee, I believe, through that, you know, they, they are in charge of that, you know, cemetery. We are trying our best to come up with some other plans, like something that everybody agree uh, and I should say, like, be more involved, especially when it comes to customs and tradition. People meet each other quite often. Uh, weddings, uh, you know, those holy, day, holy days for the Yazidi community that they all gather and celebrate. So those are the things that we are still trying to focus and, you know, fight for so people know and, you know, this new generation know, okay, what's going on? Why, do, why are we celebrating? So that's how they kind of get, you know, accustomed to the... To, the, to this uh, thing, like they know it's, it's a Yazidi holiday, it's this, this, and that. So people, so young kids will ask and then there is an answer for them. I mean, we were just a small minority and we are still a small minority and we are very well known of being our, uh, the, peace, the most peaceful, you know, uh, minority probably in, in the entire uh, globe. Um, we were still kind of looking at some, you know, some, some people were looking at us as like a third, fourth, you know, degree uh, person. Like we were not first class person or stuff like that. But I mean, we were, we were still okay. I mean, we were living. I mean, uh, we were discriminated that a lot of us were not being accepted to be like a part of, uh, uh, at that time, Saddam has his own uh, bath party, uh, you know, um, institutes when it comes to the government, like the, like what they call call it here FBI, like Saddam's uh, system was kind of really really unique and complicated. So if if you were Yazidi, you would not be accepted on those high rank uh, positions, I should say. Um, but we were okay. Like we were accepted at the colleges. We were allowed to go to. Uh, do our normal work, but we will still like kind of like an abandoned mm -hmm. uh, minority. Mm -hmm. After 2003, we were looking like in a bigger eye that we would be able to engage and uh, get our rights just like any other minority and just like any other uh, Iraqi citizen, you know, being not just be looking at a uh, third class citizen or fourth class citizen. And unfortunately, this, is, this didn't happen. Uh, we still feel like we are uh, abandoned. And uh, the college that I went to, um, I wouldn't say I had a problem with, but there, there were still some kind of difficulties here and there. And then when I moved to the second university, everybody was, everybody actually welcomed me. I mean, it was, uh, it was nice. I love the people over there, even though it's not from my own city, I should say. Um, but People were really generous and people really happy that I moved and um, I feel like I, I was not even a stranger. I feel like I'm from that town or from that city, which is Soleimani. Mm -hmm. So my experience was really, I mean, you could ask somebody else who could have a different story, but for me, 
I didn't really feel like it, it was a great experience. Actually, yes. Uh, um, although they were also Kurds, I mean, they were Kurds, and they already, and they call us that you are the origin of Kurds. That's what they they've been telling. I mean, um, uh, but at that university, actually, I learned a lot. I got the chance to go uh, and apply for like um, uh, some scholarships, and I got accepted. I was one of the nominees to go, uh, you know, um, visit the LG Electronics uh, headquarters in South Korea for three weeks. And then after that, I become a teacher assistant. I feel like I'm, I was like just, just like any other employee or citizen from that town that I'm just like one of them. And then I, you know, pursued my, my job and I got that scholarship with the Berlin Technical University. So I was sent overseas again to Germany for seven months. And uh, I was even given an opportunity to study abroad in UK uh, for a master's degree, but then I decided to come to the United States because if I were to go there, I still have to come back and have like five years, working five years because I was gone. It's just like a contract between me and the government, in Ministry of Higher Education, that's what they call it, that I would need to comply with that contract five years. If I get my master's degree, I have to go back and work at that university five years. But then five years, I thought of it, it's like too long. I better take this opportunity and go live in the United States because I can't just be like living in limbo between my hometown, which was not safe, and between here. I would just go and live with my family and just find my new life there. I think the university that I graduated from has done a really great job. They actually really prepared me. I mean, it's all on you, believe me. I mean, no, if you go to Harvard and if you don't do your, your homework and if you don't do your job, you, you, it's, it's impossible that you're going to do this and this and that. So it's all on you. So I think, uh, I think the university is a very well known and, and I think uh, I, I did my job as well and I was really, really well prepared. Uh, the, the, the way system works back there is, is completely different, 180 degrees different than what it works here. But like I said, it's all on you. And I think I was well prepared when I come here, especially, you know, being uh, traveling to, to other countries and, you know, traveling around Europe. I was, I, I didn't have that culture shock, to be honest. So when I came here, I was already, I was, I was fresh. I was not like, uh, Cutting off of school and didn't find a job and I start a different job. I know I started exactly what I was working for, same field, IT, and I just keep growing and growing. So, so my experience was perfect. For Yazidis, unfortunately, there's a lot of factors, and I'm not a politician, and I'm not like a, a, a political analyst, analyzer or, or analyst that I can tell you exactly what's going on, but. My point of view is like, uh, I think it's just people don't, don't, I mean, they just don't want us to get to that level. Like we are, before ISIS attack our villages or towns in Sinjar, Yazidis like in, in Sinjar and Sheikhan and Bashik and Bazan, which is those three major areas that where the Yazidis are actually resided. We were close to 700,000 people. So per uh, Iraqi constitution law that each 100,000 uh, 100, people, you have to have one uh, parliament member. And we didn't get that. Even though we got three or four here and there, but they were not the true Yazidi voice, I think. Uh, they were somehow attached to some political agendas here and there. And they were basically just like employees waiting for by the end of the month to get their salaries, mm -hmm. <laughs> to be honest with you. They didn't really do well for their nation and for their religion and for their, um, and that, that's something that, you know, everybody's different. I mean, I think a lot of factors are contributed to that. It's, it's because you are not independent. You're not representing the true Yazidi voice. If we can get some people who would come from the heart of this event after 2014 when we were attacked 
and who lived all this, all this, you know, drama and suffered a lot here and there, traveling and asking for help on there. If we can find somebody who would ethically, you know, earn people's trust, I think, I think that's how we can actually have some real Yazidi members and representative in the Iraqi parliament. And this is not going to come easy because of the, no one can trust the government, no one can trust the highest commission that's in charge of uh, Iraqi elections. It's all about uh, what's called pre you, you You do something for me, I, I do something for you. So, so it's like this, exactly, believe me, it's, it's all like that. So, so it's hard if you don't have the power, if you don't have a back, then it's hard to, to really represent some people from your community truly in, in that you know, high sensitive position. And that's what we're actually now suffering. We don't have anybody. Yeah. We only have one. And that one cannot do much. Yeah. People are aware now. People yeah. like social media and this internet yeah. kind of open people's mind. And they, yeah. they, I mean, if you go and ask like a 10-year-old kid, they will, yeah. they will tell you exactly what's right and what's wrong and, what, and how it should be. Yeah. But like I said, the influence, yeah. the influence and the region geographically is now kind of shared between, you know, the Turkey, yeah, Iran, Syria, and Iraq. Yeah. And then the two big pole, U.S. and Russia, and, and they both, you know, contributing with their own role. Yeah. So it's, it's a very tough situation. And it, for, for us to survive, we will have to stick with, with something. Yes. Otherwise, we will just be like, just like, try, just trying to survive yeah. and, and have our, like, uh, nose a little bit above the water, not to, not to like, sink. I mean... That's the whole, that's our situation right now. Mm -hmm. We will have to find like an ally that will get us out of there. And unfortunately, we haven't found that truthful, faithful ally. Every time we support somebody, they will turn their back on us and stab us in the back. And, and it's just a matter of mistrust now. I, absolutely. I think, yeah. I think that's uh, something really concerning our people. We have people living there now in the mountain, in, in my hometown, Kanasor, and, and other neighboring uh, towns by the Syrian border. And just like a few days or weeks ago, we heard that the Turkish Air Force, they also attacked my hometown. Uh, they have been attacking like airstrike a couple times. And actually, this is really concerning. And those innocent people, they, you know, we're losing their, their innocent people for, for nothing. I mean, I mean, what's going on? There is no mass destruction weapons over there. There is no ISIS over there. I mean, you're, really? I mean, it's, it's very concerning. So it's, we, we feel discomfort about what's going on right now, actually. And we hope something can, can happen in the near future to end this. It's, it's not just that. I mean, yeah. we feel that we are now a big community and we kind of find home here. Um, so it's, it's very difficult for people to, to take their dead back in Iraq, to Iraq. It's cost $15,000, and it takes a lot of time to do that because you have to go to the embassy and, 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 or consulate and, and sign papers, and, and you pay for somebody who would, you know, accompany that with that dead body, and it's not easy. So us having that land is, is a part of preserving the culture as well, so that way we know that we have land here, people would go there, they go visit their... Uh, dead ones on those holy days, and, and uh, th that's the whole major reason that we had that actually cemetery and bought that land. Skeptical, and they were worried about that this land will turn to like a mosque or something, that uh, there would be preachers and, you know, uh, and then they didn't know, they n never know about us. I mean, so no, we are not that type of people. Our people went there and talked to them, and they said, uh, we are just a peaceful community. We just, we, we, we just have this piece of land for our, you know, to be a cemetery, and we have the license and everything. And, and somehow, actually, they, they, after that, they, after they talked to them, their idea has changed, and, and they said, okay, well, they didn't know about that, and I think since then, case was closed, yeah. so. Yes, I think it's offensive, and I think a lot of people have to know that 
not just because I look different and I speak different language or I look like Middle Eastern that I'm a terrorist mm -hmm. or I'm a, a bad guy. I mean, you would think about people in the Middle East, uh, there is, you know, uh, probably, you know, tens and, and probably up to hundreds of different ethnicities and sects and religion who are not just, you know, the religion of, of the dominant, you know. We understand that the Islam is the dominant religion there, but not everybody who is Muslim is a bad guy, or not everybody who is Middle Eastern is a bad guy. I mean, we, we, we have to live in coexisting and uh, humanity. Humanity was actually finding everybody, I mean, why did I move to the United States? Because I wanted to find humanity. I want to be treated well, and I wanted to be uh, respected, and I wanted to be, you know, given the responsibility of what I want to carry on my shoulder, and at the same time, what I can offer to the community. So we, we, we hope that not just the Nebraska community, everybody in, in, in this country um, look at people in the Middle East like in a different way. I mean, not everybody is Osama bin Laden and they want to kill, uh, kill here, here and there and do some bad stuff. I mean, it's a good idea to screen and deep screen people who are coming to the United States just to be sure that they are not bad. But at the meantime, we hope that they will not make this as a reason or as a, uh, a, um, something that will stop people coming to the United States from those areas because there's people who have fled the war. There's people who have just become homeless, no family. They're, the majority of family members were killed by airstrikes and, and stuff. So I think these people need safe, safe haven and be treated just like humans. Mm -hmm. So um, my personal ex experience since being living here, since living here in, in, in Nebraska, um, my interaction with people, I think Nebraskan people are very helpful and they have a good heart towards that. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is just my opinion. Yeah. And I think uh, there is a lot of other people in this country that, have, that carry the same heart and the same feeling, feeling towards immigrants. Doesn't matter where they come from, from Ukraine, Russia, from Middle East, South Africa, whatever. Um, I think those people should all stand together and advocate for immigrants, because this country is actually built upon those principles that people can come and search for democracy and look for the American dream. So I, I believe everybody should give them the opportunity at least once to live the, that dream. I, I wouldn't say that I don't, I don't want to return. Mm -hmm. um, a return is always an option mm -hmm. if there is a need. And uh, that need will be um, associated with, like you mentioned, security, stability, and uh, some other factors. Um, I don't have any plans at the moment, actually, to move. Uh, I think I'm good at the moment. But like I said, my options are open. This is just personally me. Um, I, think it's, I think I can go visit. Like Visiting is always good. You grew up somewhere. You always miss those places, no matter what. Uh, especially for elderly people here, I think it's very good for them if they can and if they can afford. You know, it's it's very expensive to to fly overseas and go to Middle East. It's like your 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 cheapest ticket could be a thousand dollar. That's if you are very lucky. That's the cheapest. Then uh, what do you think about when you go on summer or, or some other vacations time, which is two thousand dollar or twenty five hundred dollar? So so I think it's always. Uh, not a bad idea to leave that option open and you can go back and forth. That doesn't mean that you are abandoning your community and your loyalty to the United States. That doesn't mean that, but I mean, people, that's one of the, that's one of the uh, Second Amendment is, to, is the life, is the freedom to assemble. So if you want to assemble anywhere within the United States and something, I think that's, that's a right that you have to keep if you think that you are safe. I wouldn't go right now, like I said. It's not safe. I would not go back and live there. Actually, I missed a lot of things about there. Before 2003, uh, people were just like on those holidays, like 
which we will have in the next couple of days, we will have our fasting. Uh, the nice thing about those days, even any, if, I were, if I was anywhere, like I was in Soleimani, I was a teacher assistant, and even if we were with the, in that military base with the Americans, they would let us go home and have those moments with our family and friends and our community. And I remember like those days, like you, you just go out and just walk and everybody's like out the streets. They're just walking and, and everybody's helping each other, especially like the, 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 the feast eve where people kind of share food and happiness and, and blessing. Um, I miss those moments actually. And when everybody's in, in the town and your relatives, your friends, coming by, you go by, visit your uncles, your aunts, and, and so forth. Um, unfortunately, we, we, I mean, we still have those stuff here, but not as much as what we have back home. So, so those are one of the things I actually missed. Uh, Yazidi just started to have their own channel, I believe, satellite channel. Um, I think there's now two or three of them. Uh, there are some others that through some other parties or supported by some other uh, political um, uh, parties that they try to you know, advertise for the Yazidi and we care about the Yazidis, but um, I don't think they, I can call them true Yazidi you know, channels or satellite channels, but like I said, there's actually like two, uh, we can call them pure Yazidi, they, they were Fund, they are funded by some uh, Yazidi businessman who just eventually passed away. Uh, it's called, I think, uh, Ezid Khan, Ezid Khan TV. And um, every once in a while, actually, I, I watch it sometimes if I have time. And, um, but other than that, we don't have that many channels. Yes. And I think it's a good idea for them, especially who live uh, overseas, that they show those, you know, holy places, they have those interviews with, you know, the Yazidi figures and they kind of tell them and educate them about the religion, about the, you know, what's going on in the area as far as policy, um, cultural events, those kind of stuff. Well, so my wife, she speaks Arabic and unfortunately she doesn't, speak, although she's Yazidi, but she doesn't speak Kurdish. So in, in, in home now, we have two languages, honestly, beside English, so it's three languages. So the communication with dad is, is pretty much Kurdish, and with the wife is Arabic, and outside the world is English. So I speak three languages every day. Uh, it was some time, it was at yeah. the beginning, very stressful job because we were just, I, I was just got, getting hired and there was a lot of terminologies that I was not aware of and yeah. I was not. And at that time, not everybody has a cell phone and a Google Translate or, or you, 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 you didn't have that technology available right on your fingertips. Yeah. Uh, so it was very difficult at the beginning. So what I had to do is I had my notebook and every time there is something new, I would have to write it down and just practice it. So it was a, t a challenging job, and it was um, also a stressful job when we go out. Not just that, it was also a dangerous job yes. because we just, we just never know at what time and what second somebody will shoot us in the head, a sniper, or we'll have a roadside bomb that will, you know, go off. So I didn't see very close to me, honestly, mm -hmm. but I saw like happen to my buddies. Uh, I didn't see it happen to me. I remember one of the situations that we got shot at when we were like in the, in the field looking for those insurgents who were crossing the border between Iraq and Syria, and they were just like random shooting. I, I didn't know what to do. At that time, I didn't have a vest to wear. I didn't have a helmet. That was like uh, kind of late 2003, actually. And uh, all I did is just jump on the ground and just hope nothing bad is gonna happen. And it took about 10 minutes and then my buddies luckily came and, and they found me and, and, and they showed me like a sign I still remember is that you have to do like this. So when, when they were like searching and doing, like running those spotlights, make sure who's, who's where, who's what. So they told me always do this. That means you are one of us. I didn't have vest, I didn't have gun, I didn't have any those of those kind of things that will, um, you know, those 
vest things you have to wear and they will glue that they know that this is you for, you know, the, the stuff that you wear when you work uh, on the street. So oh, yeah. when lights, what, what do they call them? Uh, reflectors? Like uh, reflective, like, like these things that you have on your yeah. shoes. Like, so we didn't have those type of things. So yeah. basically all you gotta do is say, okay, do this and you'll be okay. Nobody's gonna shoot, shoot on this, like, okay. Honestly, I don't know. Yeah. I, I, I don't think, I, I, my personal view, I don't think they give him a good opportunity to defend himself. He was a dictator anyways. Mm -hmm. and, and I think he, I think they should have probably given him more time um, to reveal more facts to the Iraqi people. Um, and uh, him hanging that way, I think sent a message to a lot of uh, leaders in the Arab world that he will face the same thing if you don't treat your people well. So I think that was a good thing, mm -hmm. honestly. Uh, but I just thought that if they were giving that child more time, just more, just more facts would be revealed to the Iraqi people or in, in the Arab world specifically would be probably a better idea, but. I think the Yazidis have significant impact in the Lincoln community. I think by, um, by offering a lot of jobs, um, a lot of Yazidis now are full-time employees. Um, they go to school also. A lot of their kids, they are smart. They do a good job at schools and very peaceful community. They never, they never did anything bad. They never, uh, I mean, when I say never, I mean that everybody's not the same, but for the most part, I should say, peaceful community. Um, they add a lot of culture and people were not aware of that that thing even exists until like we opened that this center with the YCC here and we have that congressman who comes in every once in a while when we have those events they would come and we have a lot of other American friends that they come and share those and become our advocates so I think the Yazidis have really enriched the um, Lincoln community with all these aspects that I just mentioned, I believe, beside the food. <laughs> but we were like a special case, but I still, it, mine, mine still took about almost, uh, for the visa, the moment I went and, and interviewed, it took me exactly about seven months for my visa to be approved and be available to be picked up. And before that, the papers and chief of mission approval and and here and there, email here and there, and get your old stuff together. So the whole process took about, I would say about a year. Yes, it's actually, uh, every year is getting harder and harder, and especially now with, with the Trump's administration. I think uh, uh, since he became a president, I, I think we only have three, four families only from the Yazidi community came to United States as a journal, I believe. As far as, according to my information, that uh, what I see, I could be wrong, but, uh, in the past, we used to have like every month at least two or three families coming. And that was really a good uh, thing for us because uh, we want uh, people who don't feel safe and uh, they feel that they're abandoned and we, we want them to come somewhere, if not US, somewhere else, Canada, Australia, but specifically we're talking about US. I think it's more strict now. I think even for me, uh, uh, bringing my wife, just like a simple example and a real life example, uh, even though I wasn't a citizen at that time, it still took her about uh, close to two years uh, through legal immigration, not, not, not just, and being like a part of all this uh, special immigrant visa and serving the U.S. military, being a cultural advisor, and being a faithful citizen to the United States Army and the government, um, we were hoping that they will, and, and on top of all that, being a persecuted minority, we were hoping that they will give us a better opportunity for our families and loved ones to come and find peace in this country. Uh, but unfortunately, that hasn't happened yet. Um, I hope this would happen sometime soon, um, just like Christians as well, because those two minorities are the ones who actually paid the lion's share when they were persecuted by Islamic State. That by Yazidis, were, they, they were the number one who, because our women and children were got enslaved. But the Christians at the same time, their homes, their properties, their money, it's all gone. 
I became a citizen exactly July 9th, 2018. A little bit over a year now. It was one of those special moments in my life. I was very emotional and uh, I wouldn't lie to you that I cried when I became a citizen. Um, those, I mean, when I say cried, I didn't cry, but I, I had those uh, tears coming out of my eyes of being uh, a U.S. citizen, and it was a special moment in my life. So I feel like now I'm, I'm in a better place, just to be, to be short. I'm in a better place, I believe. I've always been an advocate, and um, I always tell people, especially American friends, that this is who we are, um, and if they are interested, uh, I usually share some links and some real-life stories with them, and that's how I have uh, some of my coworkers actually now. They, they know all about the Yazidis. Um, because of me engaging, talk with them, and asking me where I come from, and those kind of stuff. So. I, I tell them what I have. I tell them where we suffer. I tell them where we come from. I tell them about our culture, about our history, about uh, you name it. So, and a lot of those people, I would say 100% of those people I talk to, they feel really uh, passionate and compassionate about us and how, uh, how, we peaceful, uh, we, how peaceful we are. And um, they always get intrigued and interested about learning more. And I have quite a few friends right now, even at work, that they are every day they ask about even my life and about our Yazidi community here, how they're doing and those kind of stuff.